Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Hello, yes. Thank you. Uh, this is the regularly scheduled uh, meeting of the Trinidad Planning Commission for Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. Just a brief comment of about public comment. Public comment may be submitted via email in advance of the meeting or in an orderly process during the conference orally or via email or Zoom chat. Your comments will be included in the public record for the meeting and will be accepted at any time during the meeting. Now, this evening, I believe that we have three commissioners and there is a possibility that, uh, no, okay, we're good no, to go. I was, I was able to arrange coverage for the meeting, so okay. I'll be here the whole time. Okay, well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. We would have carried on anyway, but uh, good to know. Okay, the first item on our agenda is roll call. Trevor? Commissioner Johnson. I'm here. Commissioner Hopkins. Yeah, hi. And Commissioner Hakenen. Here. And Diane will not be joining us tonight. Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. We have one set of minutes uh, from last month, February 16th. And um, any questions, comments on the minutes? I'm seeing none. Um, I, have, I, I have one comment and then I have just one item that is not necessarily uh, related directly to the minutes, but I, I just like to throw this out here right now. Um, the first item is um, on page three of the minutes, Miss Nickel, uh, let's see, and I'm on paragraph one, two, three, four, five, paragraph down, last sentence. Miss Nichols requested that the committee create a list of items that they would like to see in the usage guide. Uh, I know we talked about that a little bit um, at the uh, at the last meeting, and um, I don't think we really established any process to do that. So I don't think we need to discuss it now, but I just wanted to make sure that we didn't lose that action that we took. And uh, Trevor, I don't know if you want to take a stab at it, if you want some help from us. Um, it might be very useful to also get public comment on it as well. Uh, so I, I just thought we should maybe put this on an agenda in the, in the near term with the intent that I think we were going to come back in six months anyway and review the, the whole process and see if everything was working well. So I just didn't want to lose that. Uh, the next item is just for clarification on page eight, um, the second paragraph. Uh, actually, uh, Commissioner Hakkinen had asked for clarification regarding lot line and boundary adjustments. Uh, and the last sentence, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Parker then explained that lot line adjustments normally require a coastal development permit because they increase development potential. However, minor lot line adjustments are often excluded. Uh, I, I understand that, but in reading through this, I was a little hazy as to when a minor or a, a, yeah, minor lot line adjustment is made, how is that recorded with the county? How does the legal description of the property or parcel um get um, uh, uh, recorded so um currently any law line adjustment in the city would require planning commission approval um, but we were talking about this in terms of potential exclusions for the city um in some cities there are certain law line adjustments that meet certain conditions can be excluded um, so that's what we were talking about. In terms of recording, the recording process would be the same uh, regardless of whether it went to the Planning Commission or was approved by staff. Um, it's a new, a new legal description is prepared. Um, we get review by the, the city engineer and then um, there's a notice of, of lot line adjustment that's prepared by a surveyor 
Um, I sign it and notarize it. Um, the owner signs and notarizes it, and then it gets recorded. Great. Thank you for that explanation. And then back to your comment on page three, I would point out that it we should change committee to commission. So that should have been the planning commission. Um, I believe that was referring to. Um, my understanding from the discussion was that um, you guys would email a list of items, and I guess that should just go to me so that you're not emailing each other. Um, but if you want to put it on an agenda, um, we could do that as well. Okay, I'm. I, I agree. That's fine. We can we can do that. I just didn't want to lose track of that. We should make a, an effort to try to do that. Commission members, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve? Um, I would motion to approve. Second. second. Motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye by raising your hand. Hi. I see three hands, passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is um, approval of the agenda. We have um, four items for discussion this evening. Any questions, consideration, changes to the agenda? All right, hearing none. Motion to approve. Move to approve. <laughs> second. Second. Move and second. All in favor say aye by raising your hand. Aye. Agenda is approved. Three hands raised. Okay. Next item on the agenda is items from the floor. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak to the commission on items other than what is on our approved agenda for this evening. Are there any items from the floor? Okay, hearing none. We'll move on to the next item, which is items, uh, our agenda items. And the first agenda item is one, selection of the Planning Commission representative for the Water Advisory Committee. Trevor? Yeah, thank you. So um, the City Council at their, la at their last meeting last week um, discussed uh, reconvening the, the Water Advisory Committee that was formed um, in 2021. And um, one of the members of the advisory committee is a planning commissioner. Uh, Cheryl Kelly um, was previously the appointee from the planning commission, and now she's on the city council. So she does not meet that um, membership requirement. And so um, the planning commission should appoint a new member to the water advisory committee. And I included the resolution describing what the water committee does. Okay. Any questions, comments from the commissioners? Do we have any volunteers from the commissioners? <laughs> uh, just for clarification, Trevor, I just wanted to make it uh, make it clear. Um, this advisory committee is for just the city of Trinidad, I believe. Is that correct? My point being is that logic would say that the representative for the water advisory committee, if this is a city only committee, uh, should be resident of the city. Uh, and that means that uh, we're kind of limited then to our selection. But it wasn't clear to me, and that's why I'm asking for clarification, uh, whether or not 
um, a, a appointed member of the Water Advisory Committee needs to reside within the city limits? My interpretation would be no, it just says it's a member of the Planning Commission. It does not put additional limitations on that. Um, but if you would like to request clarification from the City Council first, um, you can do that. But I, I would say as written, that is not a requirement. Any comments from the other commissioners? I, I need to specify that I live and draw water from Mill Creek. And I don't know if that would make me, I don't know, better for it or worse for it or, but, um, and, if, and I don't really care because I have plenty to do right now, but um, just, just, I did at one time say that I was interested in water and I am definitely in, interested in water, but, um, but by all means, if somebody in the city or if some, if one of you others would like to take it, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. Thank you. Um, I'll say I am very interested in the water committee. However, I'm already on the trails committee. And um, I, I mean, I wouldn't mind giving up trails committee for this, but I don't want to then create and move the problem down the road. I know, Tom, you had expressed interest not to put you completely on the spot in the trails committee. I think back when that was open, I don't know if that still, if I'm remembering that right or not, or. I, I'd switch. I'd, I'd go with that. If that, that would be of interest to you. Yeah. I mean, okay. um, um yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I just I'm, feel not like that I'm, I'm, not that I'm dispassionate about the wa the uh, trails at all. Uh, yeah. But the water is, is particularly concerning just for longevity. And, and we've got all these grants and stuff right now. So I'd be interested in that. I don't know what the process for that would be. <laughs> yeah. And since I do live, I, I draw water where the old, where the city of Trinidad used to draw water from. And so right, I right. do kind of have a little bit of a conflict, I, I think, either there a little bit. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I definitely talk to the neighbors and stuff, but I don't want it to be a problem later on either, you know. Right. We do. That's where we still retain rights, though, as well. Correct. Technically. Yes. So, you know, from that standpoint, certainly could get reopened up. But I don't, <coughs> excuse me, just one possible solution would be to swap those two assignments, I guess, kind of. I'm yeah, I think if if the commission wants to do that, um, you could appoint Aaron tonight. He would continue to be on the trails committee, but we would put that on next month's agenda for reconsideration. To, I'm, for I'm Aaron to be that. on the water committee. What was that, Tom? For For Aaron to be on the water committee. And then next month we deal with me over to the trails committee is that what you mean yeah. yeah okay sounds like we have a plan um i guess we should have a motion well i'll move i move to appoint commissioner hackenen as the uh representative on the water advisory committee and at the next trails committee, or, sorry, at the next planning commission meeting to appoint Commissioner uh, Tom uh, Hopkins to the uh, trails committee. I'd second that. Okay, move and second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye by raising your hand. Aye. Three hands are raised, passes unanimously. Thank you, that's a good good um, solution. Thank you very much. Okay, moving right along. Next item is the STR ordinance amendment. This is discussion and decision on the amendment to the lottery provisions of the STR ordinance as requested by the city council. Sure. So this was another um, item that came out of uh, last week's city council meeting. Um, I was not in attendance. I understand Aaron was. So, you know, if he has any additional input um, to what I have, um, let me know. But I, I understand, um, you know, there was a, a request raised to um, switch from the lottery system for issuing new STR licenses when one becomes available under the cap. Um, to a first come, first first serve. 
basis and um, the council didn't, you know, didn't know what the history of the lottery was, I think was one of the issues. And so they wanted the planning commission to weigh <clears throat> in on that. Um, so just a little background, um, subsection C of the ordinance um, establishes a, a waiting list for um, areas that, that have a cap um, and additional people want STR licenses. So currently that's only in the UR zone because there are licenses available um, in the other zones. Um, well, actually there is one person on the wait list for the SR zone because the city council directed um, the, the city manager not to issue new licenses while the caps were being considered. So there, there was someone who expressed interest um, in a license in the S in the SR zone. Um, but in the UR zone, there are currently 16 licenses. Um, currently there's a cap of 19, but um, under the amendments proposed by the, the planning commission, recommended by the planning commission, there would be 18. So that would leave two licenses available. Um, there are eight people currently on, on the waiting list. Um, the first one having been submitted in 2017. Um, and, and the city has held off on holding a lottery until the ordinance amendments are decided on, um, with, particularly with the caps, because um, the city didn't want to issue licenses above what, what the new cap would be. Um, so I looked back at the history of the lottery, um, and it originally came about as a way to um, quickly get to the cap by making all the existing STRs. So when, when the cap was originally instituted, I think there were 26 or 27 STRs in the UR zone, I believe. Um, and so, and a cap was um, instituted of 19. So there were um, a number of STRs above the cap. And so as a way to quickly get to that cap, um, the Planning Commission proposed having all existing STR licenses um, be put into a lottery and, and draw 19 of them in order to, to issue those, those 19 licenses. Um, and then it, you know, it made sense to then have a lottery for, for additional licenses um, as they were, as they became available. Um, there was also actually recommended a, a five-year term on licenses and then every five years there would be another lottery. So the idea of, was, of that was to, um, increase opportunities for more people um, to have licenses, um, increase the, the equity of the system. Um, when that got to the city council, um, they decided um, that they did not want to um, use that process. They decided to um, not have the initial lottery and to get to um, licenses through attrition um, by not allowing them to be transferred, for example. So um, that's how we've gotten down below the cap at this point. Um, this, but they left in the idea of the lottery rather than a first come first serve basis for issuing new licenses under the cap, um, considering again, that would, that would give more opportunities to more people and, and be more equitable solution than first come first serve basis. Um, at this point, staff, I mean, the uh, city has not held a lottery. So staff can't really speak to how well that would work. Um, you know, there might be issues that come up that we wanna tweak the lottery once we do hold one, um, if it continues to be a thing, but I, you know, I can't really comment on how well that's gonna work. Um, you know, this is the first time this issue has come up with all the review of the ordinance at the STR committee meeting. So it's kind of a, a, a last minute um, lob. And, you know, I, I can see both sides, you know, the, the first come first serve being maybe more, more fair, more just, um, but the lottery, you know, being more equitable by providing more opportunities to more people. Um, I don't really feel strongly one way or the other, um, but I do, what I do think is that there have been a number of people on the wait list um, who have put their name on the wait list expecting a lottery. Um, and it seems a little bit less than fair to change the rules, um, you know, when, when people have been waiting years for a lottery. Um, so I wouldn't recommend changing it before ever holding one. 
Um, and then in addition, um, you know, the Coastal Commission staff have, have reviewed the amendments and, and, you know, found them to be minor. And so it would be, the amendments would be able to be processed pretty quickly by the Coastal Commission. And so, you know, any other changes could, could muddy the waters. I think we've already got a list of, of things we want to consider for a future amendment under a future review, such as changing, relaxing the standards for home shares or resident STRs. And there's some other things that have come up. Um, and the city council just wanted to move forward with the amendment as recommended by the planning commission. So I'm not really sure why this one's different, but at this point staff recommendation is to leave it as is, but to put it on the list um, for consideration under a future review of the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have to digress, digress for a second. I, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask for public comment on the appointment of uh, Hackenin and Hopkins to the different committees. Um, I just wanna make sure that if there's any public comment on that agenda item before we move forward, apologize. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on, thank you. Um, the comments uh, from uh, commissioners. Trevor, I just wanted to say thank you. That was, you know, at the, at the last meeting, it's kind of, yeah, it was, was, I was surprised that that was the first time we were hearing about this concern. Um, but it was, it was really good to get the history on this. And I thank you for that and getting kind of the background and stuff. That's what was, I felt like maybe we hadn't had a chance to hear um, as a planning commission as this was going through. Um, but so thank you for that. And I'll reserve any other comments till after any public comment. Any other comments? All right, hearing none, uh, I will open it up for uh, public comment at this point. And I don't see anybody else that's logged on. So um, unless there's someone, I see no hands raised. Uh, we'll bring it back to the uh, commission. Um, I, I just had one question, I guess, uh, uh, Trevor, and that is when do we anticipate a lottery? Do we have any idea when that would happen? I don't know. Um, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really an official action. It's kind of a de facto moratorium without actually enacting a moratorium that has a lot of legal limitations on it. Um, you know, I would say once once the the city council has approved the ordinance, there would be no reason to not hold a lottery. Um, while the planning, I mean, while the coastal commission is processing it, we wouldn't expect it, them to make any changes to anything, and so it would be pretty safe to go ahead and hold a lottery for those two licenses. Okay, thank you. Um, it does appear that we do have public comment. And uh, let's see, Jack Groupe has public comment. Uh, I emailed it to the commission. Jacques, are you online? I guess not. Richard, I don't think he's online, but he did email that to me. And um, it was uh, about around four o'clock. So I emailed it just recently to uh, the rest of the committee or the, the commission. Is, oh, okay, is it, uh, how long is it? Is something that we can read into the- uh, Sure, if you'd like, I, I could read it. Sure, thank you. Dear Trinidad Planning Commission, I would like to see the waiting list rather than a lottery. The waiting list will give everybody a chance to plan for the chaos that STRs cause to the neighborhood. We all want neighbors, not strangers. Trinidad needs a public document showing what houses are on the waiting list. The city can better plan for the negative impacts the STR will cause in an area. A waiting list will keep everyone on the up and up as it would be a public document. A public STR waiting list will help to cut down on shenanigans behind the scenes. Lotteries can be corrupted. The STR waiting list can also benefit prospective real estate buyers in Trinidad doing their due diligence, the opportunity to see if they will be living next to an STR in the future. Nobody wants an STR next to them. 
Stick to the waiting list. Do not implement a lottery of any kind. Thank you, Jacques Beaupre. Thank you. Any other public comment? All right, hearing none, I'll bring it back to the commissioners. Uh, Tom? Um, to me, this, this uh, rental, the short-term rental or the rental system that we have has been discussed so much and it has been working quite well and I like how everybody's communicating on their with their committees and and the fact that this is just coming up now is kind of interesting because everybody knew that it was a lottery system when they put their name on it. And everybody knows that the, you could have a short term rental if it's on the lottery system. So it's kind of the same as a waiting list in my mind. So anyway, that's that's my thought on it. Thank you. And just to clarify, I will point out that there there's still a wait list um, for the lottery. So there is, and the, and it it can be made public. Um, so there is a list of of people who have submitted names um, to be in the lottery. So um, it's still a wait list. It's just a lottery versus first come first serve. So my thoughts on it. I I like the concept of the lottery. Um, I'm getting a bit of an echo feedback. Is anybody else getting that? Just a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I believe so, it might be the iPhone. Oh, there we go. Thank okay. You. Thank there you. we go. Whoever that was just muted. Thank you. Um, so I like the idea of the lottery. Um, and I agree that that's what's been kind of advertised. So changing it now would be a little disingenuous. One of the things I think that would help with this, uh, and I don't know if this necessarily needs to be in the ordinance or it can be direction to the council and the, and the staff, city staff, is that I think there should be kind of like a specific time every year that the lottery occurs um and maybe working with um jennifer with the city who is currently the one that processes the applications to find out what date would make sense to do that that way people can know when to count on it and then i don't know if it's worth considering that you know after you're on the list for a year obviously if there's no vacancies then there's nothing to process but you know does the city purge the list every year and then if you want to stay on it you just simply have to say i want to stay on it but i don't know if that can be done more administratively yeah, than than uh, than adding this back in, um, so those are kind of kind of my limited thoughts on it right now. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I my first thought is that um, yes, this the system has worked up to a certain degree at this point. Although we have not had a lottery, but since it is in the ordinance, it would be very useful, I believe, to go through. The lottery process to see what uh, comes of that. The other comment I would make is that I would like to, and I'm surprised that the city council did not ask this, but I would like the STR committee to weigh in on this. They are much closer and have had <laughs> many animated discussions about the, this ordinance, and so I think it's only fair that they have an opportunity to uh, present their thoughts on it prior to actually delving into this. So um, I think what I'm hearing is uh, there's there's no real desire from the planning commission to uh, amend the provisions uh, to uh, remove the wait list and lottery at this point, not only just because we believe that we need to go through this, but also there may be some some considerations from the Coastal Commission as well. Uh, and, and then, as I said, uh, maybe an additional recommendation would be that the STR committee take this up and make a recommendation prior to the city, uh, be prior to the Planning Commission making a recommendation. Um, I noticed, Trevor, that there really wasn't a motion on this agenda item, but do you need an emotion at this point, or do we have we given you enough uh, direction to proceed? Yeah, um, good point. I would, I mean, it sounds like, um, you know, this would be something that you would want the STR committee to look at in the future, but that you would like to stick with your 
recommend recommended amendments um, as as previously recommended. And yeah, I, I think reiterating that motion would would be good for the council. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Um, I like the idea of it maybe becoming public, and and I like the other one too about purging yearly just to see who's really interested or not, or at least those that should be part of the discussion at the STR committee. Um, yeah, I, I think those are good ideas. And I think those could probably be implemented administratively because remember there is that provision that the city manager can institute administrative regulations to implement the ordinance. Um, and I think those are within the um, construct of the ordinance and so, you know, this could be something that the STR, so the, the city council can still take action on, on these amendments, but then the STR committee at their next meeting can still discuss this issue and make some recommendations and, and the city manager could potentially implement that without another amendment. Good input. Thank you. Good input. Did I hear someone there? Okay. Um, hey, Trevor, one other question that popped up um, on section three, and again, this might be something for the next iteration, but I know about the renewals and stuff, there's some dates in there, February, and whatnot. I just want to make sure those align with the process that is being done. Is that, would that be considered a major change before it went back to the Coastal Commission or if we, you know, said November instead of February or something like that to be in line with, with the process they did this year? Because I think they went out in November and then uh, you know were issued later. So I just wanna make sure the documents line up with what we're actually doing. Yeah, that date seems to be working okay. Um, you know, the idea was that, um, you know, we didn't want it to be January 1st because, you know, the holidays and, and vacations and things like that. Um, so we made it February 1st so that um, licenses could be issued, um, you know, prior to the, the tourism season so that I, be I believe they're effective prior to that right now the end of january so there's a little bit of a disconnect there just something maybe worth touching base with city staff on okay specifically jennifer <laughs> couldn't couldn't imagine who you were talking about <laughs> any further discussion Okay, it sounds like Trevor would like to have a motion from us. Anyone like to tackle it? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, I move that we leave it as is um, and don't make any changes, but also solicit input from the uh, STR committee to see if they have any thoughts or concerns about the lottery versus uh, modifications to that. Very good. Second. Sorry, Tom. Oh, I'd second that. Move and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye by raising your hand. Aye. Thank you very much. Three hands are raised. Great. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is. Um, Design review standards, discussion of new draft design review standards for development in Trinidad. Trevor? Yeah, so this is an exciting item and I'm sure um, Diane will wanna have input. So um, this, is, this is just an initial discussion. Um, you know, we have been discussing the design element of the general plan, but it was getting a little difficult at times to separate the general policies of the general plan from you know, wanting to get into the specifics of, of design standards. And so um, this is a, a task under our SB2 grant to try and come up with some more objective um, standards and, and streamline procedures for residential projects. Um, and so I went ahead and put together some, some draft guidelines um, or new design review standards. I took, um, this format from the County of San Mateo, it seemed like a lot of the examples I found were very detailed 
like books um, on design guidelines with with drawings and photos. And I, I, I don't think that Trinidad doesn't have enough development, I don't think, to justify something like that. Um, but I think that we need, you know, a little bit more specificity than what we have now. So I like the, uh, the format uh, from San Mateo where it kind of broke the, the standards down by topic. So site planning, for example, lighting signs. Um, so there, there's guidelines for each of those. And then I went ahead and I added um, Trinidad's existing design guidelines um, to the extent that that made sense. And I also added the guidelines that are currently in the draft um, community design elements. So the ones that we've been discussing, they, they do show up in those guidelines. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is, you know, maybe, maybe not all these standards are necessary. I thought that it would be better to include too many than too few so that you can kind of see the, the breadth of the options um, of what you might want to consider. So you can pick and choose um, what you think makes sense for Trinidad. And then also for context, I, I also went ahead and included um, some of the other sections from the city's design review chapter. It's not in the standard track changes format. So, uh, you know, I was, I was worried it might be a little bit confusing um, but I just sort of wanted to show you what the existing ordinance says and then what we might um, have for a process. Currently, the process for design review is the same process as for coastal development permits. Um, and so they, those procedures might refer back um, to each other, probably with the coastal development permit process. Um, taking the lead. And so this chapter would refer to that process in terms of noticing, um, application requirements, those sorts of things, um, if, if we continue to have that as a parallel process, which I think would, would be good um, to keep, keep the permit process as, as simple as possible. So, um, you know, at this point, like I said, this is an initial discussion. I'm sure this is, um, you know, we'll be talking about this for a while longer. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to take um, questions and comments and suggestions. Thank you. Um, how would you like to proceed? Shall we take it kind of page by page or I see one nod. Okay, I see two nods, I'll nod three, two. So maybe we'll just uh, just walk through it, Trevor, and each of us can give our comments to you, and hopefully we can get it through very quickly. Okay, starting with uh, page one. By the way, I, I want to say, uh, Trevor, you put a lot of work into this, and I really appreciated it. Yeah. It's a complicated issue uh, to begin with, and um, uh, I, I think you've made it as simple as it possibly can be for us, so I appreciate that. Okay. Anything that anyone has as a comment on page one? Moving on to page two. Um, I just had a question on, yeah, I've got a few comments on this one. Um, the first section there, you know, chapter shall apply to all new exterior construction requiring a building permit. So is there any kind of remodeling or alteration that would trigger design review? Um, you know, rooftop deck being added to a structure. I know that's kind of addressed later on in, in the document, but. Um, I guess that's kind of the first question on that. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, the current requirement is, yeah, any exterior modifications require design review unless exempt from a coastal development permit. So um, that's kind of how this is laid out right now is that um, it would refer to the exemptions that we're talking about as the next agenda item. Um, and so projects that are exempt from a coastal development permit would also be exempt from design review. Okay, and then I had a note here, but I'm not sure why it's right here. Uh, you had a question about minor, um, and I like, I like the concept of minor, but with some description, you know, examples, porches, landings, that kind of stuff. I don't know what those would be necessarily, but I, I like the idea of kind of allowing that option. Um, yeah, and that might be something where it's a, a we could use that administrative permit process mm -hmm. um, where 
you know, I, I would say, oh yeah, that seems minor. You can go ahead, but it would still notice the neighbors and the planning com and report to the planning commission so that someone can bring up objections. Okay. Yeah. And then in section B, um, I had a suggestion to strike, um, after planning commission, just strike the zoning administrator or the decision maker on the application, just leave it as planning commission. That kind of addresses your comment to the side of specifying or creating the position or identifying that. I think I saw that somewhere in here, um, you know, changing decision maker to planning commission, if that's the right entity, or if it was going to end up being you later on, because I saw, I think in the next agenda item, you may have mentioned having somebody else creating a new position kind of and designating that as a planner. So that's all I have for page one <laughs> or page two, technically. Tom, do you have any comments on this page? No. Uh, I had uh, one at the bottom of the page, uh, Trevor, under um, A.2, where it says appropriate design is based upon the suitability of a building for its purposes, upon the appropriate use of sound materials, and upon the principles of harmony and proportion in the elements of the building. I don't have any problem with the what's stated there, but what I was a little concerned is something that we continue to go back to, which is we wanted to make sure that this was consistent with community values and character or something to that effect. And I, I maybe I'm misinterpreting what this is supposed to say, but it just seemed like we were focused on, you know, making sure that the building had sound materials. Well, okay. But, uh, you know, somebody could say that a six story something or other, uh, is a sound building, but doesn't necessarily fit the character of the com and community values. Yeah, I can absolutely add um, that language. Okay. Yeah. All well, right, moving on to page three. My... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I, I saw that also, and, and I put to fit in well with the neighborhood, you know, uh, um, reasonably. Um, the harmony, that's a good word, but Maybe that, yeah, that could be spelled out a little bit more. Thank you. Okay. Uh, page three. Any comments on page three? I had more of a question on this one. Uh, I feel like this is covered elsewhere, right? Kind of the specificity about grading and, and, I don't know. I feel like we're getting a little specific here. I don't know if anybody else has that same sense with this. Just you know, minimizing the alteration of topography. I feel like we kind of really get into that, or do we feel like this is general enough? Well, so, I, kind of, go ahead. I was just going to say some of that comes from our design element um, policies, which are which are supposed to be general. I think these site planning ones are pretty general. And then, so it says minimize alteration of topography, but then you get into the grading section that gets more specific. Right. Um, and, and may, you know, like I said, there, there probably is too much in here and there's probably some overlap. Um, but I figured it'd be easier to, to show you, you know, the kinds of things that are out there and then, you know, we can pick and choose which ones make the most sense. Okay. Anything else on this page? Moving on to page four. Um, I felt like the first uh, item one on there, just we don't even need that. I don't feel like we have a predominant style in Trinidad, strike that entire paragraph, that entire bullet item for me. Um, and then under E2B, uh, smaller structures with sufficient open space between them, you know, multiple dwelling, that kind of business units. I didn't know if we could get a little bit more specific with that, the opposite of what I just suggested, uh, with like a, a lot coverage ratio or percentage or something along those lines. Because I feel like that leaves it a little bit open to how tightly you could pack, you know, little bungalows or something like that. Or um, that was my thought there. Yes, that that will absolutely come into play. Um, we do have setbacks currently, um, height limits currently, um, and then 
I do anticipate that we will have um, lot coverage um, requirements as well in the ordinance update. So currently we don't, um, but I imagine when we update, we will have, have some lot coverage requirements. So those will be standards um, that may vary by zone. So the okay. UR zone will probably have a different um, lot coverage requirement than the SR zone. Um, and then these, these findings kind of just bring that all together. Okay. I had one comment uh, on uh, item three, which states avoid revivalist historical styles. I don't have any idea what that means. I had to look, I had to look that up myself. So that's like Gothic or Greek or something like that, which, which there was once there was a guy, he wanted to buy the place next to, um, um, the bed and breakfast and, um, turn it into some crazy Greek column looking thing. And, um, <laughs> The owner actually didn't sell it because the design was so outlandish. <laughs> okay, um, I guess I'll <laughs> say let's leave that in for the time being. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else on page four? Page five. I, I had one comment, uh, and it's just more or less just the way the 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 the, the issue of dealing with views uh, comes across, and I think part of this uh, uh, is is shown in uh, item A at the top of the page and item D. Uh, in both cases, we that we reference the complaining party, and I think this is a result. Th this is probably out of our views and vegetation ordinance, which is basically complaint driven. But I don't think in this case that uh, the complaining party is necessarily part of the um, design review criteria. So I guess I was suggesting to remove that complaining party out of there. Yes, that's a good, good observation. Okay, anything else on page four? Sorry, page I one, five. Uh, I had one under G3, just a question about item B, access, limiting that to uh, having rooftop, rooftop decks only accessed by interior means. I'm thinking of the two closest to me, and they both have external stairwells, spiral ones. I don't know that that's necessary to have in there, um, so I, I suggest taking that out. I noticed that too, and I, I didn't think it was necessary either. Yeah, um, that's... I'm fine with that. Anything else? Page five. Okay, page six. A couple things under roof. Uh, just a question on uh, J1. Primarily pitched roofs. Does a low pitch roof qualify as a pitched roof? So a low slope roof. Um, is, is this just strictly opposed like a zero slope roof? Or what was what's the intent there, do you think? You know, I'm I'm not totally sure. Um, some guidelines do actually have a pitch, a range, like a pitch range. Um, and you know, in Trinidad, there's probably some advantage to kind of a lower pitch roof um, to to minimize view blockage. Yeah. And you know, I don't. I think there are structural reasons not to want a house with a flat roof but i don't know that there are aesthetic reasons not to um so right. maybe maybe that's not necessary i was just thinking if you know somebody wants to build a project and a low pitch roof decreases the visual impact why would we limit that option from them um was my thought on that yeah i don't see a reason to and and the, the way it's written right there really doesn't provide a lot of guidance yeah and maybe just adding a simple sentence design buildings using primarily pitched roofs, you know, including, you know, minimal pitch or minimal pitch, I, I don't know, something just to make sure folks know that's an option. And then under J4, I just had a question about the brightly colored and reflective roof treatments being avoided. I mean, obviously, you know, polished aluminum or stainless roofs are, are not necessarily what we want to see, but 
you know, if somebody wants to have a light gray or a white roof um, on their building for, you know, heat or cooling efficiency, I'm not sure that's a big issue um, provided it's not visual, you know, able to be seen. Um, so I just kind of want us to think about that, I guess, as we move forward with that one. Yeah, I think, um, and and maybe that's the caveat is if it's not seen. Um, I um, there the first metal roof that went into Trinidad was a light blue, and that got kind of a lot of attention once it went in. It's visual, it's it's visible from the beach, um, and you know there there were a number of complaints about that it wasn't particularly reflective it's just brightly colored and then i did get an inquiry about painting a roof with the white rubber reflective paint and that but that was a house that was low down right on the bluffs and so that would have been reflecting back up on other people and i said that would require design review i thought um cuz it's a it's a different material and color um so maybe the caveat is um, where we're visible from. I don't know what the wording would be, but but some caveat to that. But just as our world continues to get warmer, you know, if someone wants to put a lighter covered roof and to have less, you know, heat gain from that, I don't think we should limit them. Any other comments on this page? Okay, moving on to page seven. Comments. Uh, I just had a couple, I had two comments here uh, real fast. Under item L, unenclosed spaces. Um, this has to do with prohibiting buildings that are predominantly built on stilts. Um, <clears throat> is this even possible in Trinidad, Trevor? I think this would come up um, on a slope. Um, so, you know, where where there's a lot of space underneath where a house is sort of built cantilevered um, on a slope. Um, I, I questioned it. Um, I thought about taking it out. Um, you know, I believe, I believe the house at the end of Ewing might have a lot of empty space underneath, um, but I, you know, is, is that really problematic? I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have I don't have strong feelings about that one. I guess my comment would be is uh, I, I could leave that in there, but I think I would want to add some additional wording to the effect that uh, uh, pending uh, approval from a geological design standpoint or something to that effect. My I guess my point is that just as you pointed out. Anywhere that somebody would have uh, a house on stilts, it's going to be on a hill or a bluff. And that's the last place that we would want people to be uh, messing with the bluff or hill. So uh, that was just my concern about that. But maybe we can put some caveats in there that uh, says if you, you know, if, if the geological surveys and the design uh, are appropriate, um, so be it. Uh, I'm thinking a little bit of uh, uh, Paul Hasselquist. Uh, request and and there was some open space I believe underneath his house very not too much but you know there was a lot to be that we had to deal with in terms of the geological geological design so that's just uh, my comment there um, you you made a comment uh, TP7 the zoning ordinances will have regulatory standards in addition to these policies from the CD element. Uh, so this level of detail may not be necessary. This has to do with lighting. And I guess my comment is I agree with that. It might be just a little bit too much at this point. But, uh, you know, I can go either way. But there's a lot there. I had the same comment on Section P, just eliminate one through seven and maybe enhance just the opening paragraph a little bit with kind of general intent. And then uh, TP5, um, the efficiency, I don't think that's design review. I think we kind of cover that elsewhere in lead and green building and stuff. I think we could definitely strike that. Uh, okay, so you're saying strike strike M altogether? Yeah, I mean, I don't feel like that's really a design review necessarily. That's more, uh, you know, we encourage lead building and green building.
Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I just, I, I mean, I'm not opposed to it. I just, I just don't know if this is the right place to have that. Good comment. Okay. Anything else on this page? I think my view, I think my view on it is that I liked it and having more rules. I don't have a problem with more rules. If we don't catch it somewhere else, then we're going to catch it here. That's how I see it. I don't know. Just that's just my thought, but and I understand. I mean, I'm taking it out, but then we're like hoping to catch it somewhere else, or hoping that they're going to have, you know, the same that that lead is going to do it. Um, I, I think like hitting them over the head with it is going to be more effective than assuming that they might pick up on it somewhere else. That's just my my thought. Well, why don't yeah, we? Something like this likely wouldn't be a regulatory requirement, um, although um, the title, the city does implement Title 24, which is the yeah. green building standards. Um, so that that does help, and that will probably continue to get more strict. Um, but yeah, this is one place to pick it up, pick up something like that that's not really a regulatory requirement. But it might be... There might be other ways to use or encourage that. Um, so yeah, that, that's something we can continue to think about. Well, let's flag it and uh, we uh, will keep it in the back of our minds. Good, any other comments on this page? Okay, moving on to page eight. Anything on page eight? <laughs> I had one comment on item S3, uh, finished landscape plans should be compatible with and enhance the design of the home. Um, I thought that this should be a little bit more general and maybe we should say that the enhance the design of the structure, it's a knit, but. No, good good catch because I, I tried to take out references to homes and, and make it structure. So that's just one I missed. Okay. Any other comments on page eight? Okay, page nine. Mm -hmm. um, I had a couple here. Um, on, on the first paragraph there, I guess it's really the um, second half of S5 at the top of the page. It says the requirement for drought, drought tolerant landscaping shall not apply to fruit or vegetable gardens. Um, I think I understand the intent of this, but at the same time, I think that we need to um, encourage um, like drip systems for trees. And um, so I, I, I didn't wanna necessarily say that it, that shouldn't apply to fruit trees or vegetable gardens, but there should be something in there saying that we've got to be smart about how we irrigate, regardless of the the plants or landscaping. So that was the the comment. Uh, and the other comment I had, or another comment I had, was you know, on six. It says utilize vegetated swales and bioretention cells to aid in treatment of stormwater and dry weather runoff where appropriate. I didn't quite understand dry weather runoff. If it's dry. Is there runoff, or are we referring to something back in the issue with uh, irrigation or landscaping? That's a that's a good question, and and currently most dry weather runoff in the city is actually prohibited. Um, like I don't think you can wash your car on the street and have it run off. Um, but that would be one example: washing your car um irrigation but but again we have an ordinance that says you shouldn't irrigate so that it runs off so that's already covered so yeah let me let me look into that and think about that uh, tom did you have a comment on that i think what they're getting at is um is like the practice of of letting not waiting wanting water to run off too fast and so like as as the, it gets drier 
the water stays on the top. And by creating a swale, then the water is kind of into a pocket and then it goes down into the ground. And I thought that's what they were after. And maybe, uh, I, I forget what it's called, biotech or some, some kind of like way L of- Probably like, LID is the, the low impact development. Yeah, something like that. But I think that's what they were after. It's like the water goes into the ground. Good comments, thank you. Um, I had just another general comment and on the uh, review procedure uh, in the last paragraph of this um, page. Um, I was a little surprised that in about the middle of the of the paragraph, it says where view considerations are involved, the applicant is encouraged to contact property owners within 100 feet and show them the layout and profile of the proposed structure. I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Trevor, I thought that there was a requirement, not just to encourage, but there was a requirement that you had to notify uh, neighbors within 100 feet. So there's a requirement once an application has been submitted, um, there is a requirement to notify neighbors, you know, a, a, a certain amount of time before the hearing. This would be more of an early con the planning phase so that before they submit an application to the city, they're encouraged to talk to their neighbors um, so that they hopefully come in with a design that is acceptable. You think that's good in Trinidad? Would anything, I mean, it sounds like it could just start a fight earlier. I, you know, I actually didn't realize this is, this is in the ordinance currently, and I didn't actually, I didn't realize it was in there, but I, I do, when, when someone, um, you know, has a project in an area that is view, you know, view area, um, I do suggest that they talk to their immediate neighbors that could be impacted, <laughs> because, you know, there might be little things they can do, take off a corner of the house, you know, reduce by a couple of feet, you know, different things that they could do um, that really will minimize the impact on the neighbor's views. Very and I think it has worked. It doesn't always work, but it has worked. Hey, did we discuss at a previous meeting, and, and I don't know if this is the same or not, but kind of notifying neighbors for almost anything with, you know, story polls and that kind of stuff. I feel like we were kind of getting at that. So this feels like it might not be consistent with our overall intent to perhaps over notice. Um, which no, but I, think know, this, I, I think this is consistent with that because it's encouraging that early consultation outside of what's actually required. Um, but I do think we do need to add story polls to somewhere. And I, I think I made that comment somewhere that that would yeah. probably go in, you know, something in the process, whether it's the application requirements or it's the hearing procedures, like, you know, at least 10 days before the hearing story polls will be put up. So, so, so it will, we do definitely want to add the story poll requirement um, somewhere in the process. And I guess I'd also ask, what is the definition of a view consideration? To me, just because it's not going to impact, I don't have an ocean view for my home, but if somebody wants to put something up that impacts my view of a tree, so I think defining that, either eliminating it or I think is, is would be time well spent. Okay. Yeah, or or your privacy. Um, right. You know, one of the things that really hasn't been much of a consideration in Trinidad, but I have noticed comes up in a lot of design review guidelines are respect for the privacy of, of neighbors. You know, and setbacks yeah, so, and heights address that a little bit, but yeah, maybe views or privacy. Um, um, Trevor, getting back to that, that swell thing up above, is there, in Trinidad, are we doing like the bio swell thing similar to what Arcade is doing? Or do you know, is that in a different area? So yeah, uh, so the, the stormwater project that's going on all over town right now, that is um, putting in stormwater infiltration basins. So there, there's a yeah. couple of different kinds. Um, there's the underground um, 
chambers that actually physically filter the stormwater and then release it slowly into the soil. Um, and then mm -hmm. there are the, the swales that are more surface and just sort of slow the water down. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a couple of different kinds that are being installed in the city and those, one of the things we do have to be careful of with LID in the city is we can't necessarily encourage it everywhere because um, we don't necessarily want to be infiltrating additional water right next to bluffs and then also um, next to septic systems. So the city did do a groundwater study um, to determine where it was appropriate to infiltrate stormwater. Yeah. Yeah, that's it is different than Arcata because Arcata has got a whole different policy. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so we have gone through the design review criteria and procedures. The next item is, um, well, the next item is the existing design review criteria, which we probably should be very familiar with, hopefully. Uh, but just, just to be on the safe side, were, are there any questions or comments on uh, the existing design review criteria? Okay. I, um, I just had one in general uh, on page seven of that. And just kind of throughout the uh, saunas are becoming quite popular or accessory uses or structures. So I don't know if spas, hot tubs, saunas, that is worth including um, as people may or may not want to add those outside because some just simply plug into a wall outlet and don't require, you know, might not trigger permitting that kind of stuff for new electrical work. Just making sure we capture that. Are, are, Aaron, are you on uh, the uh, definition update? Yes. Yes. Oh, Sorry. That was okay. page. I think Let's I am. Okay. Residential okay. accessory user structure. There's a few of them listed. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. We just haven't gotten there yet. That's what I was getting to. Oh, sorry. Did I jump ahead there? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing on then the existing criteria. Okay. Moving on to definitions. Um, any questions on the first page of definitions, which start with alteration? Okay. I, I'd, I'd love to see definitions put on the top of the page or, you know, so that you can, I mean, thank you, Richard, for pointing that out. I was kind yeah. of confused. <laughs> Oh yeah, you mean uh, the the top of the page as it it says now, city of Trinidad. Right. Yeah, Trevor's real sharp here. She puts it at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then just a comment, like appealable area development. It says after certification of the Fort Bragg LCP. Obviously, those things just need to get you know search and replace. Yeah. So that one I left in there because um, I wanted to reference where these definitions were from. Um, Although the appealable area is really from the Coastal Act anyway, um, but I, I just like alteration, I've got Fort Bragg just at the end, just to point out that that's where I took that definition from. Okay, yeah, I don't know, maybe again, kind of nitpicky, but put it at the end and then actually change those to sit to city of Trinidad instead of representing okay. city of Fort okay. Bragg. Yeah, there's a number of places where um, we should replace Fort Bragg with Trinidad. But then I do very much, Trevor, appreciate the reference at the end. That helps me a great deal as I'm, you know, learning this process with everybody. Right. Yeah, especially with, with with if it already exists in our current ordinances. Right. Yeah. That's that's super super handy. Okay. Anything else on page one? Oh, sorry. Was that my overhead there? Oh, is that you? Okay. Wasn't sure if someone was trying to ask a question. Okay, anything on page two? Again, there's a, under coastal zone, um, I would suggest that we say means that land and water area of the state in the city limits of Trinidad, rather than just of the city. Anything else? Page three? 
Uh, one of the things that we have, we ultimate or eventually need to resolve is the issue of the diameter of a tree at DDH. And uh, we don't necessarily have to do that tonight, but that's something that we'll have to be consistent with. Uh, anything on page four? By the way, I like the definitions. I like this as being able to see them specifically. Okay, page five. Um, I'm sorry, could I go back to page four real quick? Absolutely. Um, I see the floor area ratio. Um, could we spell out that that's the outside of the exterior wall? Like, uh, if that's what you want. I mean, I, I know it's kind of self-explanatory, but if it says outside, then there's no, like, how to do square footage. It, real estate does it different than, you know, it, there's different ways. So I think um, it does say the maximum floor area of all structures measured from exterior wall to exterior wall. But I guess that's yeah, the out, outer edge of the exterior wall, yeah. I mean, just a logistical thing. Is it is that realistic? I mean, I I don't know. Are we concerned about you know having two foot thick walls, or I'm just thinking the ease to actually measure. You know, for me to measure the exterior dimensions of my home versus the interior wall space. I don't know. That's where it, that's when it comes up. It all comes down right. to money. You know, like, do you want to add it or? Uh, so anyway, I don't care how we do it. I no, just, I don't. I just, yeah. Let's, uh, yeah. I will look for examples of, <laughs> of that. And just following, just following through on that issue on page five at the top, it's, it's a little hard for me to understand this uh, figure. I mean, I understand it, but the rationale or the logic for it really is kind of strange. If you look at the four-story building, and even though the footprint remains the same, the lot coverage reduces by a, 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 to 25% of the footprint. How, how do they reconcile that? I, I don't understand that. Well, so there... Um, often there are lock coverage limitations as well as floor to area ratio. So these are all 25% floor to area ratio, and they're just showing different configurations with 25% floor to area ratio that can have varying lock coverage percentages. But the lock coverage still is the same. Right. Yeah, the footprint, footprint remains the same, right? I see what you're saying, Richard. Well, no, the, the footprint the footprint gets smaller. So from, from top to bottom, the footprint gets smaller. So so that that okay. So you're saying that I should not um oh now I see. Okay, it's it's so not intuitively obvious, but yes, the four floors footprint is a little smaller, huh? <laughs> so, you know, okay. the, the figure is supposed to be helpful, and if this figure <laughs> is not helpful, <laughs> then um, we we shouldn't include it. I, I see what they were trying to get through now. Now that I see it, yeah. Okay, uh, it's a little confusing. It, it's not obvious that that four one is is actually smaller. Especially the two floor looks almost the same. Yeah, yeah. And now that I see there is a, a, a distinct difference between two floors and four floors, but uh, that's a little difficult to see in this particular uh, isometric design, uh, uh, view. I can look for other figures. I think the city of Arcata has some of these figures in their um, code. So yeah. theoretically, uh, let's just say that the the single story is a thousand square feet. In this representation, each of those buildings are a total of a thousand square feet to keep that 0.25 ratio, right? That's correct. Okay, so yeah. maybe something that kind of adds that yeah. would really help seal the the concept. <laughs> okay. 
like example of buildings with same each building is you know i don't know good comment anything else on this page page five page six anything on page six anything on page seven Um, I just had one thing for clarification, Trevor. In the middle of the page, it states um, also includes the indoor storage of automobiles, including their incidental restoration and repair. Um, I wasn't certain what that was intended to uh, define. What 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 is what's so special about restoration and repair? Maybe it's a big thing in Fort Bragg that people wanted to make sure was was clear. Um, you know, I think, you know, because there's definitely a difference between an auto repair shop and, you know, restoring a vehicle in your own garage. Um, a lot of times outdoor storage of vehicles is not allowed. So you wouldn't be able to have a, a vehicle that doesn't run out in your driveway, for example. Um, but in your garage, you can work on it. But I don't. I don't know that that's really necessary for Trinidad. I mean, it could be boats. Maybe boats is more appropriate in Trinidad. <laughs> well, I just wonder if there was some logic behind the way that they had worded that. I I don't know. Okay, Tom. I I I'm hearing of houses in Tahoe where people are building these huge garages with glass just to look at their cars. <laughs> Like wow. it's part of the it's part of the entryway. Yeah, you walk by and maybe that's what they're looking at. I'm gonna do that to show off my Prius. I was just gonna say my Prius will look really good in a glass garage too. <laughs> uh, and uh, and Aaron, of course, had suggested that we add uh, saunas in there yep, as well. Good. Thank okay. you. I was about to give that plug myself. Anything on, else on page seven? Moving right along, page eight. Okay, page nine. I just had a question. Are there examples of supportive housing in Humboldt County? I was just kind of curious. And is that a use that could ever be allowable or is it statutorily mandated to be allowable? Or It's statutorily mandated okay. to be allowable, yes. Um, but I can look for some examples. No, I was just curious. If it's if it's mandated, that's fine. I was more idle curiosity. I don't need to invest your time in that. Thanks, though. <laughs> Okay, anything on page nine? Um, just uh, the last zoning administrator, would we want to specify, is that going to be the city planner or who is that person? I think it'd be helpful just to tighten that up for what it means in Trinidad. So that could either be, I left it general. Um, I noticed um, some ordinances, a lot of ordinances don't actually define it. They they just include it um, in the ordinance. It, it creates a, a zoning administrator. Um, the city of Arcata has a definition and defines it as the community development director. Um, but it could be set by res it could be set by resolution of the city council. Um, so you know, for example, if if Trinidad ever does get its own you know, community development director, then it's easier to change that way. Um, but I'm I'm fine with defining it as the city planner here. Um, I, you know, there's a number of ways you could approach that. Okay, any other comments on uh, definitions? I, I'd like to just say once again, how how well this is looking. It's just a pleasure to see Trevor, and uh, you know it's not it's not too much, and or it's not you know it's just just well done. I think you know I'm really happy to happy to see it. Good good job, yeah. Thank you. I I am. Um, I we did get um. Just a, oh, it's kind of an aside. We did, we did get the Coastal Commission grant um, that we applied for, so two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to finish updating the LCP, which will include updating the entire zoning ordinance. And um, 
it, it's kind of nice to bite off some chunks like this um, and look at it piece by piece, but also, you know, you start to get into references to other sections. And so in some ways it's also difficult to look at piece by piece. Um, so that it's, it's gonna be a big, that's gonna be a big project and it's gonna be, um, it will be interesting, um, but I'm I'm excited because our ordinance is is so bad, um, and so you know just definitions are are um, you know really nice to to have have these things. So I'm I'm glad that you um, you appreciate it because it's um, I'm excited about it. Great. Okay, I'll open it up for any potential public comment. And again, I don't see any, so if I, I see no hands raised or anyone. Okay, so we'll move on. Is there any other comments that uh, commissioners would like to make before we move on to the next agenda item? Just one, I don't know where it would fit into this, Trevor, but I, I like the concept we've, we've kicked around and it comes up later in the next agenda item, but of a consent calendar kind of thing. So I don't know if there's opportunities in this, you know, as you have some administrative room to, you know, make uh, uh, review considerations, that kind of stuff, putting that at least forth ahead of the, the planning commission is kind of just like a final opportunity for the public to see it and just it increases transparency for folks if they have concerns about that. Very good. So is that something you are saying, you know, maybe implement now or, um, or you're just wanting to keep it as part of our process, our, our new process as we go through these? I'm fine with the new process. I just, if it, as an example, you know, I'll have folks ask me questions about projects in town that may or may not have been approved ministerially. And I know we're kind of muddying topics a little bit here, but it's just, if that at least came before, it gives me a chance to be educated in just like a quick, concise packet and gives them a chance to say, hey, you know, I have a concern about that. Well, one thing I could I could look into, you know, I, I don't think that the, you know, agenda is necessarily, um, you know, laid out in the regulations. I, I do think we have some flexibility on that. And like, for example, um, my staff report could be a, a consent agenda item. And I actually put a staff report in in the packet like the city council does. Um, that's something we could implement now, um, you know, and, and, you know, maybe um, the, the folks at City Hall could help me put together a list of, you know, kind of current projects, building permits, things like that. Um, if I mean, it might, guys... yeah, it might be an easier lift to kind of do it from this point forward, rather than having to go back and try and figure out what's ongoing. Let's oh, just, sure, sure. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know, just, just a thought. Because as I do wander around town, there are a few folks that tend to just ask me questions and things as I see them. Uh, it's nice to be able to give them an educated answer somewhat. Yeah, I, I agree. Interesting concept, the truth. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to our last agenda item, which is uh, project streamlining exemptions, exclusions, and administrative permits. Trevor? I'm gonna lead yeah, this it's just, I was just finishing my notes. Um, so yeah, so um, exemptions and exclusions, this is a continuation of our discussion at the last meeting. Um, I've made some adjustments and changes based on comments and questions at the last meeting. Um, the definitions that I put together also apply to, to these, and I tried to pull out some of the things that, that would be good to define. Um, I did also separate the exemptions and exclusions from the administrative procedures because they aren't going to be consecutive in the ordinance, and so I don't want to ca cause confusion that way. Um, I did put together a, a flow chart of the administrative permit process, um, so you can visualize that a little bit more. And then as requested, I, I included the Coastal Commission's exclusion order um, that set out the existing CDP 
what we call exemptions in our ordinance. Okay, thank you. Um, if it's uh, acceptable to the commissioners, uh, shall we just go through this like we have been doing one page at a time and I think we can get through it fairly quickly. Okay, anything on, I, I'm looking at uh, draft CDP exemptions and exclusions, page one, anything on page one? Uh, I had a few. TP1, uh, the concept of either making it apply to all of town or sectioning it out, I guess, convince me why we would want to make it different in different parts of town. Um, why we wouldn't, it just for streamlining and ease, why should one area be, if that makes sense. I guess I'm kind of thinking just keep it all the same in all areas on that point. I... Yes, I and that's why I did it this way is to because I think in Trinidad, Trinidad is so used to having design review for everything, um, you know, and we have talked about exempting, you know, areas uh, east of the freeway, for example, not having design review for those. But the, but I think that the in in general, the um, the community ha opinion has been that they want to keep design review everywhere they don't want you know the other side of the tracks over there the um and and so that it would be the same for all of town and i you know the 10 percent increase that seems reasonable to me um you know i think i would only suggest that you go back to the coastal act exemptions if you're going to have different design review exemptions from coastal act exemptions which there are some advantages and disadvantages, but I think that that just makes the process so much more complicated. I would just keep it all the same. Not, not, and the other thought I had is that, you know, that we do have the sphere of influence, which extends outside of some of those areas. So if we exclude them now, and then at some point down the road, the city begins to grow, I don't know what circumstance would you know, dictate that, but now we've got kind of potentially an island of an area that wasn't viewed the same way as the rest of the rest of the city. So I kind of like the idea of keeping it consistent. Um, on that point. Um, I had two more, the uh, highly scenic. Um, I kind of like that concept. Um, I don't know what that would mean, but I kind of liked keeping that in TP3. Um, TP4, um, I don't think there should be any time limit. I think just because a property passes, this is the, the increase, just because a property uh, time or ownership passes, it's still the same issue for me, sequential enlarging of a, of a structure of a footprint, that kind of stuff. That was all I had on page one. Um, I, I also had a question on TP4, but I think I went the, the opposite direction that you went, Aaron. Um, oh. I was thinking that um, it, it, in my mind, especially with some of the older properties in Trinidad, as an example, you know, you could go back 50 years and see three or four different iterations of the property. And so I was trying to figure out if there's some way that, you know, we need to put that time limit on there. Um, but, You're then, saying but, but then again, as I realized uh, after I said that, um, that you know, the zoning ordinances didn't come into effect until what, 1978, nine. So uh, maybe, maybe that's the limit. I don't know. So are you kind of thinking, Richard, like if you know, you've got a larger lot that has a small bungalow on it, an old fisherman's cottage, and it's like, well, why couldn't they make it more, you know, in line with what they could be able to do today kind of an idea? Yeah, or they took the small fisherman cottage and added, uh, you know, 20 years ago, they added a bedroom. Right. And then um, now somebody wants to make it, um, you know, a bigger place. Uh, how far back do we have to go? Oh, I, okay, I see what you're saying. Is that what you meant, Trevor? How, how far? No, I, no, that's a, a good point. Um, it's, well, it does say an improvement to the structure has previously been undertaken pursuant to this section. So um, I would say that this this would only apply from the time it's adopted going forward. So that if someone added on, you know, I think what Richard's getting at is say someone added on 50% or 20% uh, 
30 years ago. Now, if they try and do 2%, is that um, not exempt? And I think it would be. And I also think, you know, also the way it's written is pursuant to this section. So if someone got um, a coastal development permit and design review approval to do a 15% expansion, and then in in five years, they want to do 5%, that would be exempt because they got approval for the 10 or 15%, whatever it was in the past. And so it's, it's only, ex it, it only applies to exemption. So if you get design review approval for 15%, you're still exempt for up to 10% in the future. But if you were exempt for 5% in the future, in the past, you only get another 5% exemption in the future. Does that make sense? <laughs> that just seems so, so complicated. Um, and I'm not sure I have an answer either way. It's just that it sounds harder than it needs to be. But I, I do definitely see and agree, Richard, I think with your point that, you know, just because somebody doubled the size 20 years ago, if it's still undersized for the lot, they shouldn't be limited. And I, I like, I, I agree with that. What, Overall, though, the zoning ordinance will limit what they can do on a lot, right? They'll come up against that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we'll have a maximum lot coverage and a maximum floor to area ratio, um, you know, with, you know, right, right now those are flexible, um, you know, so when we update those regulations, we'll have to decide you know, is this, is this hard and fast um, right. or is it um, flexible depending on, on the circumstances? Here's a hypothetical. So you've got a small cottage and let's say whatever we do here limits it from being enlarged. Could I then turn around and demolish it and apply and put a new structure on there as new construction at the new guidelines? Yes, yes. So why would we limit one when they would want to keep a, you know what I mean? Those, there's a disconnect between those two limitations, kind of. I don't know if that's a bad but it, thing. It's really, I mean, this isn't saying you can't do another addition. It's just saying you have to come go through the public process to do another addition. So anything over 10%, you have to come forward and ask for permission. This is just an exemption. Yeah. Got okay. All right. Do we have a hard limit on size increase no percentage wise in the zoning ordinance i can't no okay no there's just the the 2000 square foot max guideline okay. and then we also use a 25 percent florida area ratio as a guideline but it's not codified mm. but it will be if once this is in place that's right yeah okay yeah. Mm. okay all right um Clear as mud. Um, <laughs> but and, I, now, I, and, and the thing, so someone could propose and see that this is why it's kind of, it is difficult to review these in a vacuum because they don't occur in a vacuum, even though they seem like a nice little chunk to bite off. Um, but so, yeah, so someone could propose 10% increase and they might be exempt from a coastal development permit, but they still have to meet the setbacks for that zone, they still have to meet the lot coverage for that zone, they still have to meet the floor to area ratio for the zone. So they can't propose something that's not, that wouldn't be allowed under that 10%. Okay, I think I understand the intent there. Anything else on page one? <laughs> She's only page one. <laughs> yeah, moving right along. Page two. Before we leave uh, page one, so, or, so there's the exemption for replacement of 50% or less of, of the structure. Um, and that actually comes from the Coastal Act repair and maintenance exemptions. And do you feel it's better in the structural exemptions or in the repair and maintenance exemptions, or do you want it in both? Um, 
I, I, I think until we get a little more familiar with this, I'd rather have it in both. Okay. Just, just so that we don't lose it. And then, um, you know, we can always decide if we want to take it out one place or the other or, or in some way modify it. That, that's just me. If anybody else has any comments on that. Okay. Uh, let's see. We were on page two. Anything on page two? Page three. I have a very cryptic note on your comment, TP13. Um, it had to do with um, the, uh, uh, the construction of any specified major water using development, including but not limited to swimming pools or construction or extension of any landscaping irrigation system. And your comment was that the CC regulations this only applies to areas, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, that have a critically short water supply that must be maintained. Um, I guess my question would be is, there may be development or improvements or whatever you wanna call it, construction of a major water development, but in the end, it may save water as opposed to using more water. So is it necessary that there be a declaration that there is a critical water supply? It would seem to me that we would want to encourage people that whatever they do, that they are um, minimizing water and, and the development that they're suggesting may even in the long run be able to save water. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of examples like um, someone has a, a landscaping irrigation system now uh, but new techniques and new technology allow them to, say, put in a super, super cool drip system, which actually saves water. But do they need that critical water shortage declaration to, to, get, to do that? That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, so remember, this is, these are the exemptions. <laughs> so... So it's basically saying something that would use a lot more water is not exempt. Um, is not exempt. Okay. Is not exempt. Okay. So, because these are the... So these are exceptions. These are exceptions to the yes. exemptions. Yes. 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 Okay. Double negative. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Brain cramp. Okay. Anything uh, else on page three? TP fourteen. What is what is that getting at? Oh, I was just commenting that I added that because. I was looking more closely at the Coastal Commission regulations, and that's in the Coastal Commission regulations. And then, and even though that's not likely to come up in Trinidad, they'll probably want us to have it in there. Okay. Good comment. Okay, page four. Uh, e three. Um, I just had a question. Will be cited in the same location on the affected property as the destroyed structure. And I just had a, a comment on that. What if uh, a proposed location is better than the original location? Maybe it wasn't well cited to begin with. Um, or am I getting lost in the exemption to the exception here, <laughs> which is completely possible? I think if it were in a different location, so this is a, this is kind of a... It's it's actually sort of surprising in, in some ways that this is in the Coastal Act. Um, so, you know, uh, somebody's house got knocked out by a tsunami. 
or well, I don't know if a fire would be a natural disaster, then they're allowed to build, rebuild their house in the same location, regardless of geologic setbacks, hazards, um, that kind of thing. But if they want to put it in a different location, a better location, then, then they would need the geologic studies and they would need to go through the design review and they'd need to go through the permitting process. So this is kind of a an odd little exception in, in the Coastal Act, I think. So could somebody, though, if they wanted to relocate it, they would just have to go through a different process to be able to do that. So it's still an option for a homeowner. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then that's fine. I just want to make sure we weren't closing that out. Okay. So then on with Hasselquist's project, if he, if he just wanted to rebuild it exactly the same, there would have been no problem with the Coastal Commission. Is that correct? Or Coastal? No, he because he was replacing it. more than 50%. So okay. um, if he, now if he had kept the foundation and 50% of the walls, yes, he could have rebuilt it. Um, but it was, so, but he was doing it voluntarily as opposed to, you know, if it had gotten knocked off the bluff by a tsunami, he could have rebuilt the same thing, but with a better foundation, I, I suppose. It doesn't limit that it has to be the exact same construction. Hmm. Okay, any other comments on page four? Page five. How's 12 inches sound for DBH as a standard? I'm just going to throw a number out there. We keep talking about how we need to, so I'll just put one out there. I've seen that come up in a lot of language. Um, I don't know. I'll throw it out there. And then my other one was for TP22. I believe that's in reference to B2, resulting in a greater degree of nonconformity to a parcel with lot boundary line adjustments. Um, I just had a kind of a question or comment. You, you say that it's probably not currently allowed based uh, – but we just did that, for example, in Bob Lake's property, right? Because it did not, or am I, again, right? I mean, because that, that we approved that because it did not. That's right. Because it did a not. Degree, right? It did not increase the existing degree of nonconformity. Now, that one was an odd one because it, it did increase the existing degree of nonconformity for one thing, but. Right, but it kind of averaged out. It, to, it, it yeah. averaged out. So, um, so yes, we did just approve one. Now, so Bob Lakes under this exclusion, he would have been excluded. He could have done that. I could have approved that or it would have been excluded. Um, and he wouldn't have had to get the coastal development permit because it didn't increase the existing degree of nonconformity. Um, and I don't know, I don't know why you would ever, well, so here's an example. Um, I got a recent inquiry on Underwood um, and someone wanted to, they found out that the fence was not built on the property line. And so they wanted to just adjust the property line to the fence, but it would have made the lot next to it smaller and the lot was already undersized. So it would have, increase the degree of nonconformity. So I said he couldn't do it. Would we want to allow something like that? I mean, it was it was a foot or two difference, you know. Um, so, so maybe we do want to allow some sort of exception well, process for that. I, I think a lot of this goes to your flow chart. And, and you know, when, when we take these specific examples and we look at them and we plug them into the flow chart, I, in my mind, it's, it becomes pretty obvious that, yeah, maybe you don't get an exemption or an exception. You just have to go the normal CDP route. And so we're not, we're not saying you can't do it. We're just saying that the uh, complexity is a little bit greater because you have to go through the permitting process. A am I correct when I say that? Yes, absolutely. So um, although currently... You couldn't, they couldn't even come to the planning commission and get that approval, I don't think. Um, now, 
I guess the wording of that could be of the non-conforming regulations is not a hundred percent clear when it comes to lot sizes. Um, but, uh, but we've always kind of just said you can't increase the existing non-conformity of a structure or a lot. So right now they wouldn't even be able to come and ask for approval because it's just not allowed. Um, I see. Uh, well, I, Okay, I, I would think they would still be able to come at least and make their case whether or not the coastal uh, the planning commission would approve it is a different issue. Well, I guess, you know, he wanted to apply for a variance, so he could have applied for a variance that allows exceptions, but variances are limited to very special circumstances. And so, again, I guess he could have come forward, but staff wouldn't have recommended approval. I understand that. Yes. Okay. Not to get down into the weeds too far. No, but I, I think it is good to look at some recent projects and how how would they, you know, flow through these because I think that's very helpful to think of them that way. Good point. Uh, with respect to Aaron's comment, uh, I agree. Twelve inches. Um, my, my point there is that, uh, you know, we've had enough instances of tree removal in Trinidad. Um, and I would, I think we try, we should try to do our very best to make sure that whatever is done is done to the maximum, um, available to us to regulate it. I would hate to see people taking down. 18 inch trees just because they can take 18 inch trees down. Um, I, I just I just have a philosophical problem with that. So uh, I, I would also suggest 12 inches as as uh, the uh, the right number there. 12 inches or less in diameter, which I think you were referring to uh, a one there on that page. Yep. Okay. Works for me. Um. Any other comments on page uh, five? Page six. D5 saunas. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did have a question, uh, Trevor, on uh, item F, temporary structures. I was a little surprised that there was such an emphasis on conservation and cultural resource regulations. Can you explain where that came from? So yeah, so what I think I, I took these um, from from Santa Cruz was my original model, um, and so they must have they must have um, a set of regulations that apply, you know, to environmentally sensitive habitat areas, for example, um, you know, setbacks from sensitive habitat, things like that. So I think that's what that is referring to. Trinidad currently doesn't have anything like that, which is why I highlighted it. I think I added cultural um, because thinking that maybe Trinidad might have some regulations along those lines as well. Um, but um, yeah, so it's referring to regulations that Trinidad currently does not have. Well, I, I, I can understand that. I was just trying to, uh, I was just surprised at that, uh, that unique focus on um, conservation and cultural. I guess what it means is that, um, you know, temporary structures don't necessarily have to meet setbacks. They don't have to, maybe they can be located in open space, like a, a pop-up tent on the beach, you know, um, things like that. So, so they don't have to meet those requirements, but they do have to meet, you know, you can't plop it down on a plover nest or something, um, or, or in, you know, in a wetland or whatever. Okay. I think that's what that's getting at. Um, okay. I could pull those regulations um, to get a better idea of what that's referring to. Fair enough. Okay. Anything else on page six? Page seven. Anything on page seven? All right. 
That is then the end of the exemptions and exclusions. Moving on to administrative CDP procedures. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, so this is still under the same agenda item, so I'll get public comment when we're done here. Uh, everybody's still okay with going through page by page real quickly? Okay, page one. Um, anything on page one? Uh, one comment, this is one place where I thought under uh, applicability, maybe item two under applicability might be where we want to discuss uh, story polls, witness polls, whatever we want to call them. And then also down under B5, I thought that was a little difficult to define. It might be a little vague. Um, one person's public opposition or controversy may not be another's. So I, I wasn't sure how to handle that. And I don't know how to define that prior to, um, uh, you know, any, any discussion about the development permits. Would that get tackled kind of uh, with section G, which we'll get to later about the consent calendar, that'll provide an opportunity for someone if they have public opposition or controversy to say something then for an administrative permit? Yes, it could. It would. It would get picked up then for sure. Um, but I think this was just sort of if if there's a project that you know I know is going to be controversial, um, a, a, a cell tower. I I don't know um, that I. Why bother even starting this process? But you're right. It's it's difficult to define, and it says known or probable pu public controversy. So I guess that would be up to me to decide. Do I think this project's going to be controversial and just head it off before we even get to the consent calendar point? Yeah, I'm just looking at a you know current example, and that's the uh, new sign at the school. Uh, you know, there was a fair amount of discussion pro and con on that. So um, yeah, that, that would be a tough call. Okay, anything else on this page? Page two. I just, the 100 foot bound line in item two, um, is that a Coastal Commission recommendation or where does that 100 foot come from? You know, it's, it's kind of, it's such a small town. I mean, I don't want to notice everybody, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of in favor of over-noticing and under-noticing to a certain extent is, is, would be my thought. But, you know, you folks have a lot more miles traveled into this planning world than I do. So I don't know what the kind of Pandora's box that might open. So yeah, so I believe the the hundred feet is in the Coastal Commission regulations. That's what they require for their coastal development permits. Um, it does exclude rights of ways, so you don't count streets. Um, I I tend to um, do more like 150, um, usually just to err on the side of caution. Um, so a hundred is fairly common, um, although for Things like use permits, subdivisions. Um, a lot of times you see 300 feet. Um, in Trinidad, 300 feet would be a, a lot. Um, you know, I don't, you know, we could, we could bump that up. Um, you know, in, in a lot of places, 100 feet really isn't that many parcels. Um, but we could do, you know, 150, 200, 300. I'm I'm open on that. I, I guess I'll just start out to one of the some of the the, the the feedback that we get. I feel like uh, hearing here and at, at council meetings is that people didn't know about things and could we notice them more and that kind of stuff. So it's uh, I don't know. Do we need to? Are there plenty of opportunities to find it out? I, I might say personally there is. It's on the website. It's in the count. But would it give us one more way to feel comfortable? Like look, we did. We're above this minimum standard. Um, sure. I, just a thought, something to think about. Yeah, good comment. 
Okay. Um, anything on page three? Okay. Page four. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Uh, just back to section G, page two and three. I guess it's kind of a little bit of each, the report to the Planning Commission. That's that's the consent calendar kind of concept, correct, Trevor? And that would obviously be part of any public agenda packet ahead of time, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. And this is where, um, you know, a, a member of the public could request that it get pulled or request that the Planning Perfect. Commission vote to, to change it. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on page three? Okay. Page four. And last but not least, the flow chart. Thanks, Trevor. This helps a lot. Love the flow chart. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's a good, that's definitely uh, something that's very useful. Okay. Um, unless someone has any desire to go through the, um, the Coastal Commission documents, I didn't think so. I made some notes, <laughs> but I won't go through them. <laughs> okay, um, I'll open this up for a comment from the public if there's anyone that is um, here for the public. Okay, seeing or hearing no one, bring it back to the commissioners. Any final comments or questions uh, anything else on uh, the item for CDP uh, procedures? Okay, that is that concludes the um, agenda items for discussion, hearing, and uh, the decision and action. Next just item, real, are... just real quick before we move on, Richard, I just encourage. You guys to keep thinking about these and email me any thoughts um again thinking about projects around town um how they would fit and something you think doesn't work or awkward um just let me know um some of these notes and questions i've got in the margin if something occurs to you you know feel free to send me an email um and then i also wanted to ask about the the matrix i provided at the last meeting do you want me to take that a little further for other projects? Maybe put some more specific things in there. Um, is, is there anything more I could do to sort of help facilitate your review and consideration? Uh, good question. Um, I, they, I, you know, to be honest with you, I did not get a chance to review the matrix today. Uh, but based on what I recall, I think whatever we can do to improve that will really help us. Um, so yeah, if, if there's anything that, um, and again, I'll, I think we should all take the action to maybe review the matrix. And if we have any specific comments, let, let's get them back to Trevor. Make sense? Yep. Okay. All right, next item are commissioner reports. Do we have any reports from any of the commissioners? Yes, Tom. Um, so I, I'm now involved with something called COAD and community action. It's uh, kind of at the high level of, of, um, of an organization com with all the different cities and uh, tribes and all that. And so uh, anyway, just this is for uh, emergency planning and uh, You'll be hearing more about it, just kind of giving you a report on it. I've talked to Dick Kieselhorst. He's going to help get it out to West Haven also. And this is just kind of, uh, you know, so that we know where the food's going to come from or where the horses, who who's can take the horses and stuff like that, you know, the, the stuff that happens. Um, so anyway, you'll hear more about it. It's exciting and it's happening in uh, Humboldt, Del Norte, and Trinity County. I vaguely remember seeing something about that. Yeah, great, thank you. Any other reports? Staff report. 
Trevor? Yeah, I think uh, I don't have anything too much to update. I'm just going to continue to work on these SB2 tasks. Um, I have been making a little bit of progress with the general plan figures. Um, it was it was a lot of work to to get the city limits and some of the parcel lines buttoned up, um, but I think we've gotten over that hurdle. So I'm I'm starting to get some more figures. So that's very good because then I can because I didn't want to re send my response to the Coastal Commission until I had new figures. Um, so then we can keep going on the the general plan update. Um, Still haven't heard anything on the OPC grant, which is the, the Coastal Hazards Planning Grant, which is really disappointing because that, you know, it's going to hold up the entire rest of the general plan update and LCP update if we don't get going on that soon. Um, but what, like I mentioned, we did get our uh, grant from the Coastal Commission, so that's exciting. Um, I have a couple of old applications that are pending, the, the two... Um, zone changes that I've mentioned before that I'm still waiting for additional information on those and one application for an addition, um, but they, they're they still working on their plans. Um, so I don't expect those. I think the we'll continue with these, the design review and the um, project streamlining on the next agenda, which is just probably good. There's not too much because I'm out. Um, I'm out of town from the 6th to the 16th, so that's packet week. So um, I might get you the packets early or I'll have city staff do that for you for the meeting on the 20th. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Next item on our agenda are future agenda items and the list gets a little bit longer every week or every month. Although I, I was, I'll just make a real quick comment. There was a very interesting article in the Wall, Wall Street, North Coast Journal this week um, about tsunami sign, sirens and how they're considering maybe just deleting that system, uh, which is interesting because they believe that the, I think it's called Humboldt Alert or Alert Humboldt system is over and, ab over and above much more efficient and as we all know, Trinidad's uh, uh, siren hasn't worked for years. And so uh, this will be an interesting topic to maybe get into once the county decides what to do. Apparently, there are several counties in Oregon which have just nixed the whole system and um, save a lot of money and are using a much more efficient system of contacting people via their cell phones and uh, special radios, et cetera. So if you get a chance to read that article, it's very interesting and, and it's very insightful into what may happen to that uh, agenda item. <laughs> they how, do they, how do they um, notify tourists, visitors that are hanging out that, at the beach? That is the one item that people are stuck on right now is, and, and they, they made a point very, I'll make it quick. They made a point of saying that while people um, who are residents can use the alert system, the um, public and people in the water uh, cannot. And so there's gotta be some sort of educational process if the, if the water recedes or, you know, it suddenly changes in, you know, characteristics, get out. But that, that's the one issue, but, uh, They've got to figure something out because right now the sirens don't work. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. I will look for that. Uh, me too. Okay. Anything else before we adjourn? Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we did a lot of good stuff tonight. Uh, it took a little bit longer than I expected, but uh, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, commissioners. And we will see you next. And thank you, staff, who's still hanging in there. <laughs> City Clerk Thank and you. Jennifer, looks like, or is that you, Aaron? No, we're that's... adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.